it is my pleasure to <laughs> introduce one of uh, the main organizers of this uh, workshop, uh, Jean Barbier, which will tell us about bias optimal limits in structural PCA and uh, how to reach them. So Jean, please take the lead. Thank you, Francesca. So, <laughs> Federica, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is... Um, I wanted to present this work because this, I, I thought it was really on, on spot for this conference and it's something I was, I'm still pretty excited about, so um, I hope I'll, I'll be able to, to, to transmit it. This is a, a work that, that took us quite some effort to, 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 to bring about. It's, it's uh, something that is connected to uh, Bayesian in France in, in a problem that we all know very well, which is principal component analysis. And I will tell you uh, some things about this problem in, in a setting which is slightly different than the one we're used to, where noise is uh, considered independent, uh, unstructured. We'll try to go a bit beyond that, which is uh, precisely the, the, the point of this conference. And so this is a joint work with people that, that you will, uh, of course, recognize. Francesco Camilli, who is not anymore uh, in Bologna, but who is now in uh, ICTP here. We're lucky to have him here uh, for a few months. Uh, Marco Mondelli, who is in the crowd, uh, that you all know. And Manuel Saez, who is another, another organizer and that uh, is going to arrive tomorrow. So this, uh, this paper, you can find it on archive, but hopefully in a, a week or two, it should be uh, accessible in the proceeding of uh, National Academy of Sciences. So, you, you. All right, so what do you do when you have access to a large matrix of data that can represent anything? Uh, just for the sake of simplicity in this talk, I will consider all matrices to be symmetric, okay? So eigenvalues will al always be real. So what you do, of course, uh, the first thing in order to make any sense of this uh, data is to diagonalize, diagonalize this, this matrix and try to find the dominant eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So this is PCA. Uh, this is actually spectral PCA because here you, you really, this is a spectral algorithm. And what happens when you do spectral PCA in the ideal world? So let's start with, a, with, a, with, this, uh, with this case. So the ideal world in the realm of uh, the statistics of uh, inference of, uh, of matrices is the so-called spike model that, um, that looks like this. So the data matrix Y is constructed as a low rank matrix of information X transpose, uh, X star, X star transpose. The star will denote the unknown vector that you want to infer. And the noise is Z, the Wigner matrix, which is of size uh, N by N, okay? So this was introduced uh, in the context of statistics uh, by Johnstone, and that it has been studied by many communities, uh, in particular in, the, in random matrices, and this is what led to the understanding of one the, of the most famous uh, threshold phenomena, phase transition phenomenon in, in information processing, which is the well-known uh, BBP transition, for, uh, that stands for Benarus, Bake, and Peche, who understood that around 2000. So this, uh, what is this BBP transition? So this uh, spectrum here represents the eigenvalues of this data matrix Y. And what you see is that you have a bulk of eigenvalues that lie below the well-known uh, semicircle law, the Wigner law. And you see an outlier here, which is actually associated to this rank one matrix. So it is not precisely uh, so the eigenvector associated to that is not exactly X star, but it is correlated with it. And uh, you see that this outlier pops out from this bulk in the case actually where lambda is big enough. And so you have this phase transition. If this lambda, which we call the signal to noise ratio is not big enough, this outlier with, would not be there and it would be hidden in this bulk and you could not perform inference, okay? And so I call that the ideal world because in this world here you see that this noisy part is assumed, uh, is very simple in the sense that it's essentially Gaussian, okay? It has independent entries. Now, if you look at this problem from the perspective of Bayesian in France and information theory, the, the kind of picture that uh, people obtained over the years, 
uh, is the following phase diagram. So here I plot the so-called mean square error as a function of this signal to noise ratio, which controls the hardness of the problem. And the picture that was obtained uh, is this kind of generic phase diagram where you have the presence of a so-called impossible regime, an hard regime, and an easy inference regime. So let me tell you what they mean. In this impossible regime, which is below the so-called information theoretic phase transition, you see that the MSC of any algorithm, in particular the black curve corresponding to the minimum mean square error, which is the best error you could reach with the best algorithm in the universe, independently of any computational concern. If, so usually this algorithm requires an exponentially large uh, amount of time and computation to, 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 to run. But let's say we don't care about uh, computational um, questions. This is what you would reach anyway. The performance would be very poor. And so this is a phase where there is simply not enough information in the data to say anything, okay? So it's a statistically impossible regime. In this easy regime, what you see is that the MSC is instead very low, and actually it overlaps with the performance you would reach with an efficient algorithm that we've heard uh, about already, which is approximate message passing, which is this red curve. And so we call it easy because there exists a polynomial time algorithm matching the performance of this usually unreachable minimum mean square error performance, uh, which is really the base optimal performance. Instead, if you were to use the spectral PCA algorithm that just take the data, diagonalize uh, it, and look at the principal eigenvector, so the first eigenvector associated to the top eigenvalue, this is the performance you would reach. It would still be non-trivial, and you see the transition is at the same point, the so-called algorithmic transition, but it would be uh, not as good as AMP and very far, actually, from this uh, MMSC performance. And in between, you have the presence of this hard phase, or what we call a computational gap, where we don't know any uh, polynomial time algorithm able to say anything meaningful, Okay, so the AMP and spectral PCA lead to that performance, while the MMSC performance so the, is there, okay? And so this picture has been obtained through the hard work of many people. Actually, the list here could be a whole slide. I just put some, some, some names uh, that, uh, that worked on this. So this, this diagram here, let me just precise, was obtained for the case where the low of the signal that you want to infer is uh, a sparse uh, vector. So essentially it has a fraction of zero entries and the rest are plus or minus one taken randomly. And let me emphasize that in this talk, the law that I will consider for this signal part, this X star part, will always be simple. Instead, what will be non-trivial will be the law of the noise, okay? So in this way, we'll decouple the effect of the correlations induced by the noise and the ones induced by sig the signal. You have to keep in mind that until now, most of the research has really focused on understanding the effect of the structure in the signal part, taking more and more complicated distribution for that part, while keeping very simple assumptions for the noisy part. While here we do the opposite. We want to understand really the effect of the structure in the noise. So let me now go in the non-ideal world, okay? So the non-ideal world looks like this. So here is a picture, a typical picture you could extract from uh, a random paper in neuroscience, actually probably a very interesting paper, where people look at, for example, um, a time series of uh, neurons that are spiking in time. And here is how the matrix look like. And so one of the first thing people do, as you can see from this plot, is taking these this matrices, uh, multiplying it with their transpose, and doing a spectral principal component analysis, and they look at the principal directions in this data. But the striking thing when you see this data, of course, is that it, whatever it contains, it's far from being just a simple rank one matrix plus an independent Gaussian noise. It is highly structured. Whatever you would call the signal in this matrix and whatever you would call noise, the noise will, will have a highly non-trivial structure, okay? And in this work, we want to capture the effect of this structure. So here is, for example, the kind of spectrum you could get for the, the covariance of this kind of structured matrices. 
you see that it is, it do, it is not um, described by any standard uh, distribution in random matrices. It is highly non-trivial. It is hard to say what is the signal part, what is the noise part, are these outliers, is it part of the noisy bulk? You don't know, okay? And the reason of the complexity of this law is the fact that the noise, whatever it means, is a highly structured object meaning that it has statistical dependencies. You cannot consider that the entries of the noise in this matrix are independent of each other, okay? Let me motivate a bit further what, why considering noise is, is something uh, which we think is important. Uh, and this is the following fact, what you would call signal and what you would call noise in any task is actually strongly dependent on the task you want to solve. So for example, if I show you these pictures, I think that maybe 90% of the crowd will have naturally uh, done a binary classifications of these images into uh, dogs and cats. And uh, we're, because this is the standard task we're used to, to describe in, in supervised machine learning. Uh, okay, but now if instead I was giving you this data set and telling you that I, you want to learn something about the notion of inside versus outside, in this case, you see that the features corresponding to what is a dog and what is a cat would actually play the role of noise for this specific task, okay? And of course, the features of dogs and cats are not Gaussian features. They are highly structured things, okay? So if my task is to distinguish outside versus inside, this being a cat and this being a dog would be noise for my task, yet it's, it's highly structured, and you want to capture this. Okay. All right, of course, uh, studying dogs and cats is, is highly non-trivial, and we are theoreticians, so we want to have a tractable models. So what we've done is to come back to our uh, esteemed uh, spike model, which has exactly the same form as before. Again, the entries of this signal part of this X star will be taken IID according to a very simple law, okay, which is known. And instead, the non-trivial assumptions will be made now on the noise. So what are we going to take? Z will be decomposed as O transpose DO, where now O is a R matrix, okay, which appeared in the previous talk as well, meaning just a uniformly sampled matrix in the group of orthogonal matrices of size n by n. Okay? Instead, the structure in this noise will be encoded by the distribution of eigenvalues, these diagonal matrix of eigenvalues, and uh, the only case where this matrix Z would have independent entries up to the symmetry constraint would be the case where the eigenvalues here would be drawn from the semicircle Wigner distribution that I shown before. For any other case, if you plug any other type of eigenvalues here, even if the eigenvectors are generic, are uniformly distributed, this matrix would have highly non-trivial statistical dependencies among its elements, okay? Another way to represent this kind of so-called rotationally invariant matrices is through this kind of trace ensembles. So Z is drawn according to this measure, and here you should think of V of Z as acting only on the eigenvalues. So when I wrote V of Z, what I mean really is this. Okay, so this so-called potential function V here is really a function acting just individually on each eigenvalues, okay? The eigenvectors are untouched, and you see because you have this trace appearing, if you rotate this V of Z by any rotation here, this rotation would simplify, and therefore this law is indeed invariant by rotation, okay? From the perspective of random matrices, this, this type of ensembles have been studied a lot, in particular, we have uh, Benay George and Nada Kuditi have understood very well the generalization of the so-called BBP transition for this kind of noises. But here we want to study this problem from the perspective of Bayesian inference, okay? Let me just give an example. If you take this potential to be a quartic function, in this case, if you write down this law in terms of the matrix element, here is what you obtain, and you see that this 
uh, this PDF cannot be factorized over the matrix element. Instead, if you were taking x squared, what you would obtain here would just be product over ij of exponential minus zij squared. And therefore, you would have full factorization over the matrix entries, which is not the case here, okay? So you have statistical dependencies in the matrix element. So let's take a concrete example. The potential I'm going to consider in this, uh, in this uh, talk will take the following form. It will be an interpolation between a quadratic part and a quartic part. And uh, the coefficients mu and gamma depend on each other in a way that when mu goes to zero, gamma increase. Okay, so think of gamma as the only free parameter in this ensemble. And uh, this will allow me to interpolate between a case where I have a purely uh, quadratic potential, meaning we go back to the purely unstructured noise, which is the standard theory, Gaussian noise, to a case where gamma increase and mu decrease, where the noise is structured, okay? Where you have this kind of four-point correlations in the law of the matrix elements that I showed before. You have this kind of dependencies, okay? So uh, I will call the asymptotic limit when n goes to infinity of the spectral density uh, of this matrix rho, okay? So this di are the eigenvalues. And uh, here is how it looks like when mu is equal to 0, 0.5, and 1, and when mu is equal to uh, 0, uh, gamma, of course, is, is non-zero, okay? And uh, when mu is 0.5, we have a bit of the two terms. And this is the shape you get, and let me try to, to, to give you some insights of what you get this kind of weird shape. So you see when mu is equal to one, we have only the quadratic part and this gamma is zero, so we have the, the, the noise, uh, Gaussian noise case, so the pure semicircle law. And when mu uh, decrease and this part increase, you see this kind of double whale appearing. You have this kind of two bumps appearing. And the reason is that if you write this law in terms of the eigenvalues only, because again, the law of the eigenvectors is just the uniform law, okay? If you do the change of variable from matrix elements to eigenvalues and eigenvectors, here is the PDF that you get for the eigenvalues. And you have a Jacobian that appears when you do the change of variable, and here is the Jacobian. And in random matrices, this is called the van der Monde, uh, determinant. And if you think of this as a kind of uh, physical system, you could exponentiate this term, and you would see that in the exponent, that you can think as an Hamiltonian of a kind of particle systems, you would get this term, which is a potential energy term. So these particles, these eigenvalues, uh, are feeling this kind of external potential, and you have this kind of pairwise interaction between uh, particles, and they try to repeal each other, because you, you see here you have this product with a difference, so this term is inducing a repulsion between the eigenvalues. So you can think of a kind of cool, uh, of a gas of charged particles with the same charge, and they repeal each other. So what happens if you put a fluid of particles in a strongly con confining potential, which are repealing each other. At some point, if you confine them too much, which is the case when you increase the, uh, this term here, because the potential goes from quadratic to quartic, so you are strongly confining these particles. At the same time, they try to repeal each other. So what they will do, they will climb the wall, the potential wall, and this is how you get this weird shape, okay? Perfect. Let me now introduce the Bayesian framework I'm going to consider. So uh, here is the so-called uh, Bayes uh, posterior distribution for my hidden spike X given the data Y. It is a normalization, which you can think as a partition function, times the prior distribution of X, which again is simple. This is just fully factorized over the entries of X, times my uh, uh, likelihood, which is uh, coming uh, there that you recognize with this potential here, okay? So essentially, this is the law of the noise, okay? And the objects I'm interested to compute in, uh, to compute are the entropy of the data distribution, which you would call the free energy in physics, okay? 
uh, which is minus the expected log partition function, where the P of Y, which is the distribution of the data unconditionally, is the partition function. And uh, in information theory, of course, this is the standard Shannon entropy, uh, which is identified with the free energy in the context of Bayesian inference. And the second quantity is the order parameter of the problem is the minimum mean square error. So it represents the scaled asymptotic limit of the uh, square deviation between the ground truth spike that I'm trying to infer and the best estimator in the universe, which is the posterior mean. So this notation here, this expectation conditional on Y, really means the average with respect to this base posterior, okay? And you can show in one line that this is the best estimator in the universe. If you could compute this expectation, which is computationally demanding, because it requires computing this normalization, which as usual in statistical mechanics is the difficult part, you could have access to this estimator and get the best performance. Okay, but of course it's, it's usually hard. And this is of course also related to so-called base risk or overlap in physics. Okay, so free energy and overlap. Uh, let me uh, give a few uh, references related to, to, this is a very biased list of, of references, but uh, these kind of uh, models have been studied a lot in the literature, in particular when the noise is completely unstructured, so it comes from the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, meaning just a Gaussian noise. You have a long list of people having worked on that. In this case, the spectral density is just a semicircle low. So in this case, we have no structure. Uh, in the realm of random matrices, uh, this model has been studied, as I mentioned, by these people, and they, they understood this generalized BBP transition. Again, in the uh, random matrices, the kind of estimators they're interested in are related to the first eigenvector, the principal eigenvector uh, associated to the data. So this is really the spectral PCI estimator. And this uh, rescaling coefficient here can be computed. Uh, in the case of uh, Bayesian inference, uh, there exist, uh, there, there is in the literature a very nice approximate message passing algorithm that has been uh, introduced um, by uh, Manfred, who is in the, uh, the crowd, and, uh, and Winter, and uh, then later expanded by Zufan in a, in a slightly different form. Uh, so essentially this AMP algorithm is what we call the top equations in physics. Uh, they have been developed for this structural PCA problem. Uh, for the special case, really, of this inference problem, it, it is really ZOO that, that have made it, uh, based on, on this work. And this AMP algorithm is, uh, in a sense, aware of the data structure, in the sense that it takes as input the spectral density of, uh, of the noise. It is aware of the prior distribution used to generate the ground truth, and of the data, of course. But as I will show you, uh, it is suboptimal, and one of our contributions is to design a conjecturally optimal AMP for this algorithm, and I will give you some insights of why this AMP there is suboptimal. Another very nice uh, works are, um, are those of uh, Francesco and collaborators from Bologna, and uh, the group of uh, Alice and Justin, who is in the crowd, and Florian Lenka who have studied uh, this, uh, this, this, this PCA problem, and there is some structure. In the sense, you see that now the, each data point yij is potentially drawn from a different law, which is indexed by this ij, which is uh, conditionally on the signal, of course, but here you still have independence. So it means that this law can change from point to point, Yet, conditionally on X star, each data point is independent. And this is really a crucial assumption. And what is very nice in this setting is that through this independence assumption, you have a strong universality property that imply, in particular, that from the information theoretic perspective, this model, so at the level of entropies, free energies, order parameters, like the minimum mean square error that I've discussed before, this model, is indistinguishable in the asymptotic limit of a Gaussian model, okay, where you have additive Gaussian noise, where now the noise has a kind of variance profile. Okay, so you see the variance of the noise may depend on which point you are looking at. So you have a strong universality taking place here, which, which is very nice. 
while in the model that I'm going, that I'm discussing right now, you don't have this universality because we lose the independence assumption among the entries of the noise. Okay. All right. So what are the results that we obtain? First result is a replica symmetric formula for this Shannon entropy of the data, which again, as, as physicists, you can think as the free energy in the thermodynamic limit of uh, the large size. So it comes in the form of a variational uh, problem over uh, an explicit replica symmetric formula. So let me show you how explicit it is. Um, so it's a matter of, of, uh, of taste whether you define that explicit or not. Uh, I think as a physicist you would, maybe as, a, as someone not, <laughs> not uh, a, let's say used with this kind of replica formula, it looks like a bit mysterious, and it is actually, but you can plug that in a computer, solve the ex extremization problem, and get actually plots. And um, this variational formula in particular, in the case of this quadratic plus quartic potential uh, used to generate the noise, uh, depends on 13 other parameters. So, uh, but actually, if you massage this formula and and understand some hidden symmetries in this formula, you can, reduce, uh, you can reduce it to only two or three other parameters. Uh, another uh, consequence of this analysis, of this replica analysis, is a formula for the uh, minimum mean square error uh, that looks much simpler, but actually don't get fooled. This M is actually uh, complicated because this M is the solution. It's the M that appears here, and you should take the solution of this variational formula and plug it in this uh, very nice looking uh, formula there to actually get the value of the MMSC. Okay. And uh, a nice insight that we got from this work is the optim optimality of spectral principal component analysis for uh, rotation invariant priors. So what do I mean by this? Uh, it means that if the signal part in your uh, data has no real structure in the sense that it was drawn uniformly, uh, uniformly on the sphere or as a Gaussian vector, then uh, we show, and let me emphasize that all this is non rigorous this is replica-based, we show that um, you cannot do better than taking the principal eigenvector of the data as an estimator. Okay, so you can try to do Bayesian inference, you will not get uh, any additional uh, boost in performance, okay? So if you have no prior information about the distribution of the uh, signal, just diagonalize the data, take the principal eigenvector, this is the best you can do, okay? Even if the noise is highly structured, this is the point. Now, this is where uh, information theoretic results on the algorithmic side, um, what we show is that what I would call the natural approximate message passing for structured PCA, which was um, developed by Zhu, is, is suboptimal. So why do I call it uh, natural? Simply because this is the kind of recursion that appeared uh, usually in the literature. Uh, where, uh, so how look typically an AMP? Uh, it's a kind of uh, iterative algorithm where you have two steps. You have uh, U, which represents the estimator of your uh, unknown signal, which is multiplied by your matrix. Then you remove a so-called Onzager term, whose role is to help the convergence of the algorithm in the sense that it will make the statistics of this second iterate F here, this second quantity, uh, asymptotically Gaussian distributed. And this implies first that you can get a asymptotic analysis of this algorithm, and it, it helps for convergence. So you remove this Onzager reaction term, where these B quantities are called the Onzager, uh, Onzager terms depend, are aware of the spectral distribution of the noise, and aware of the, um, sorry, of the spectral distribution of the noise. So this is a kind of uh, power iterate. Then you get this F, and this F you pass it through a nonlinearity that we call the denoiser, which is aware of the prior distribution and you get the new uh, estimate of U, and you repeat, okay? And so what we show is that this algorithm does not yield the uh, conjecturally uh, base optimal performance, which is obtained through the replica method. This MMSE formula that we obtained before here is supposedly the best performance you can reach in the universe, and this algorithm does not saturate it, and I will tell you why. 
Instead, what you should do is do something very similar in the sense that you still an AMP algorithm, but instead of multiplying your iterates u by the actual data, what you first need to do is to apply a so-called uh, preprocessing function j, which is a polynomial function of the data. Then remove the onzeiger, which are different, okay, and then apply your denoising function. Here, think of h and g as uh, essentially the same function. So you see the only difference here is that we first apply this, this function to the data, and you see this function is non-trivial. Uh, in this case, it's a, it is a polynomial of order three, and the coefficients are dependent on what? They are dependent on the signal to noise ratio lambda in the problem, and on the coefficients mu and gamma, which are the parameters defining the potential from which the eigenvalues were distributed, okay? So this is a part which is aware of the noise structure, okay? We are in the so-called Bayesian optimal setting. We know all the parameters. The only thing we don't know is the signal that we want to extract, okay? So I know these parameters. I can compute this function, plug it there, and uh, iterate this AMP, and I claim that this is uh, the correct approach. It's not the only one, but it's, it's a correct approach. Um, so let me just remark, why do you get this weird polynomial of order three? Uh, these powers here are really in the matrix sense, and this is y times y in the matrix sense, so it's, it's not entry-wise. Uh, or you can think of this as a polynomial applying, uh, applied on the eigenvalues, this is equivalent. Um, why is it a polynomial of order three? Because the original potential in the problem I'm considering at the moment is a polynomial of order four. You can show if the polynomial of, is of order k, the, uh, the function you would need to apply here would be of this order k minus one, okay? And it would be increasingly complex as the structure in the noise would become more and more complicated, okay? And uh, a third and result that we obtain, and this is a, a rigorous result in the paper, is the so-called state evolution analysis for this algorithm, which essentially states that in, the, uh, in a proper uh, asymptotic limit, uh, the statistics of these two kind of iterates, this u and this f, which are high dimensional vectors, uh, reduce to Gaussian statistics of scalar variables that can be tracked uh, very easily. And essentially the only thing you need to track are the means and covariance of these Gaussians and uh, this kind of effective low-dimensional uh, Gaussian uh, equation is able to track in time uh, all the statistics you want to extract from this algorithm, okay? And the fact that you can obtain this kind of theorems, this kind of state evolution analysis, is really due to the fact that here you remove this non-trivial Onzager correction that kind of Gaussianify this, this, uh, these quantities. Okay, is there any question? On... Okay. So let's check that I'm not uh, lying to you. Uh, so here is the first plot where, so I'm considering the, the entries of the signal very simple. They are generated uh, as Rademacher variables. They are uh, uniformly sampled as minus ones and plus ones. In this case, mu is equal to one, so mu equal to one means the pure semicircle low for the, the eigenvalues, meaning a pure Gaussian noise. In this case, you see that the replica prediction uh, is perfectly aligned with the state evolution prediction for our algorithm, as well as the uh, prediction for this previously introduced uh, approximate message passing. Here is a slightly different version. Um, uh, whose reference is that? Is it? Uh, So this is also zoo, yes. So these are two AMPs, uh, slightly different by zoo for this, this problem, and everything collapses in the case where the noise is Gaussian, as it should. So this is the MSE as a function of the signal to noise ratio. Let me now tune in the structure in the noise. Um, so in, let's look at this figure, where now the eigenvalues follow this blue distribution. You see a gap appearing between the prediction from the replica theory in black and the state evolution, as well as the uh, actual instances that we run with the algorithm 
um, this, this base optimal algorithm, uh, AMP algorithm that we introduced, which are here. While the previously introduced AMP is, is a bit on, on top here, so it is suboptimal. So it's probably suboptimal because we have this state evolution analysis which is rigorous and which is below this blue curve, which is also a theorem. What is, conjecturally, uh, what is a conjecture here is that the replica prediction in black uh, is actually really uh, capturing the behavior of the minimum in square estimator, okay? So you have this gap appearing, meaning that in a sense, you need really to exploit this noise structure in the way we introduced to fully capture it and get uh, a boost in performance. Let me now discuss uh, some aspects of universality because this is uh, one of the key concepts of this conference. So what we do here is, is w what we wanted to see is, is whether uh, the assumptions we make in this work were robust. So what is the main assumption? The main assumption is that the noise is rotationally invariant, meaning that the, eigenval the eigenvectors are uniformly sampled in the set of orthogonal matrices. They are generic, okay? Uh, so what we did is to take real data, let's say the, the set of images uh, from CIFAR 10 which represent uh, cats or planes, and what we did is to take these, 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 these images, build their covariance matrix, diagonalize these covariance matrices, and take the eigenvectors of these matrices, okay? Instead of generating the eigenvectors totally randomly, we take them, we extract them from the images of cats from CIFAR 10, okay? In between, we sandwich the eigenvectors with eigenvalues that are drawn according to the distribution we are analyzing, this kind of shape. What we do is this, but now these are the eigenvectors of the cats of the covariance of the cat's images in CIFAR 10, okay? Instead, the eigenvalues are still drawn according to the ensemble we are analyzing, okay? And we uh, run the algorithm and see what we get. And surprisingly, we get a perfect agreement with the replica prediction and the state evolution uh, analysis of this AMP, which is really derived for the case where O is R distributed. We do the same with another data set, which is uh, coming from uh, some gene expressions in biology, and we see again a very good, a very good agreement. And there is also agreement in the dynamics, so in time, okay? In the iterates of the algorithm. Let me now push a bit more the analysis to have even more structure. So now the potential I'm going to consider is not anymore uh, quartic, but cestic. So this is, uh, this is the potential we're considering. And this induces even longer correlations between the matrix elements in the noise, okay? So the, the dependencies are stronger. And what you see now is that the gap is even more increasing between the previously introduced AMP and ours. Um, you see now that the, the MMSC difference is at the linear scale, what, while the previous plots were at the, in, at the logarithmic scale. And uh, so I think the, this plot, uh, which is also uh, where we, we did the same uh, for real instances for the, the CIFAR 10 images, as well as the, the compared to the theory, is really vindicating uh, the analysis and uh, and I like very much this plot, yeah, that's... Um... All right, let me, uh, am I on time? At what time did I start, two? Yeah, I have five minutes, maybe, okay. Let me give you just some insights of what is happening uh, through this, uh, what we call optimal pre-processing of the data. So, like I said, if, if the potential uh, underlying the random matrix ensemble uh, behind the noise is indeed the quadratic plus quartic. Uh, this is the optimal function that you should apply to your data before processing it uh, through AMP. So let's look at what happens uh, to your data when you do so. So here is the uh, spectral distribution, so the empirical spectral distribution in blue and the asymptotic one in orange for the data before any pre-processing, okay, so this is just the spectral distribution of Y. 
And so you see this kind of double whale that I showed you with the outlier corresponding to the spike. Now, here is the function j, okay, that is applied individually to each eigenvalues. So it corresponds to this function applied individually. Okay? And what you see is that after the application of this function, all the eigenvalues that were part of the noise bulk here have been pushed on the negative axis. Okay? And instead, the outlier, which was, which was not so far from the boundary of the noise, has been pushed even further on the right. Okay? So you have a kind of cleaning effect due, this, due, due to this function of the spectrum. This is when the signal-to-noise ratio is not too high. Let's see what happens when the signal-to-noise ratio is higher, so you are more confident in your data. The, the data is of better quality. Now the function looks like this, and you see that the effect, the cleaning effect, is even more dramatic. Again, the noisy eigenvalues have been pushed to the negative axis, so you can read off directly what is noise from what is uh, not noise. And instead, the outlier, which was around 5 before the preprocessing, has been pushed around uh, 20. Okay? So what is nice to notice is that if you look at the kind of boundary decision of this function, between that, the decision between what this function considers as noisy eigenvalues, which will be sent to the negative axis, so the transition is there. So all the eigenvalues there will be pushed to the negative axis. And instead, those on the right of this point, which is around 5, will be pushed on the right. And indeed, you see that the outlier here is precisely around 5. So this function is aware of what really should be noise and what should be signal. Okay? So what is also nice is that think of this problem, but not in, for large instances, but instead for smaller instances, for n equal, I don't know, 20, 50. Uh, of course, in this case, the noisy eigenvalues here will not be as cleanly uh, supported below this asymptotic curve. You will have some of them that might be there, for example, due to the finite size effects. Yet, this function will be able to optimally clean and send to the negative axis these eigenvalues. So you have this, this kind of cleaning effect for uh, rare deviations. Okay? But keep in mind that th this algorithm that we, that we introduce, this AMP, is not a spectral algorithm. Because, of course, if you apply this function to the data, you're not changing anything to the eigenvectors. It only acts on the eigenvalues. So if you were to look at the top eigenvector of this matrix here, you would get exactly the same estimator as looking at the top eigenvector of the original data before any preprocessing. So you would, not, you would not improve the spectral algorithm by applying this function. Instead, the Bayesian algorithm, this AMP algorithm, which is really Bayesian in nature, does feels the effect of this function that acts on the eigenvalues only. So something highly non-trivial is happening there, which we do not fully understand, to be honest, and we don't have um, a recipe yet to guess what's the correct form of this preprocessing uh, before doing this, this, this whole replica computation, which is uh, rather painful. It would be very nice to understand what is going on there and what's the genetic phenomenon. It's not yet the case. But in theory, all this uh, machinery that we developed here could be extended to uh, arbitrarily complex noise structure. Uh, and, uh, and there must be a more generic um, machinery behind that, a more generic phenomenon, which we, which we do not fully capture yet. But I, I think we, we, there are nice insights that, uh, from this work. And uh, I think that's last thing I want to say, two minutes. Let me give you one insight of uh, why this previously introduced AMP algorithm is suboptimal. So what we did is the following. We, uh, so here is this, this AMP, this suboptimal AMP, where the data is processed instead of, of the J of Y. And what we did is a replica analysis, again, but for another Bayesian framework. We did the replica analysis for a case where the statistician would make the wrong assumption that the noise is Gaussian, while it is not. The noise is not Gaussian, it is structured, 
but this statistician is not exploiting this structure and is therefore considering wrongly a Gaussian likelihood for the noise. So you see here, uh, this is indeed a Gaussian PDF, you have a square. The prior is still the correct one. The statistician is aware of what's the distribution of the ground truth X. And um, the statistician is therefore sampling this mismatched posterior distribution. And uh, in this case, the replica analysis is indeed perfectly falling behind the state evolution predicting the performance of this algorithm. So what does it tell us? It tells us that this algorithm is implicitly making the wrong assumption that the noise is Gaussian, while it is not. Yet, something, this algorithm is still aware of the noise structure. It is exploiting it in a way through the dependencies of these Onzaga reaction terms. But actually, it's exploiting the noise structure in a way to make the algorithm convergent. Despite it is suboptimal, the algorithm will converge to the fixed point given by the replica prediction which is there, okay? So this, this, this AMP is exploiting the, the, the structure for algorithmic purpose, for convergence issues, but not in a way to improve the statistical uh, performance, okay? Uh, so my last uh, slide, so let me give you a recipe to in theory better process your data through a Bayesian approach in the context of this structure spike model. So, do you have any prior information about the low rank information hidden in the structured noise? If the answer is no, then the an our analysis tells us that don't bother, just use spectral PCA because you cannot beat it. If uh, you don't know anything about the signal, the best thing you can do is spectral PCA, okay? Now, if you have some information about the signal, and it is not just a Gaussian signal, then you should exploit it in some way. Okay, now you wonder, do you have any knowledge about the statistical dependencies in the noise? If the answer is no, then you can use uh, this AMP, the standard uh, AMP there, which is exploiting the, no, uh, the signal structure through this denoising function. This is aware of this distribution here. And it will be convergent, so it's still a good uh, Bayesian algorithm but it is not fully exploiting the noise structure, okay? So if instead you know something about the noise structure as well, then we recommend to use this, uh, this uh, AMP that does so, that exploits both the noise and the, data, uh, and the signal structure uh, jointly in order, to improve, uh, in order to improve the performance. All right, this is everything I wanted to say. Uh, I thank you very much, and uh, I thank you very much again. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much, Jean, for the great talk. Uh, are there any questions for Jean? Okay, I arrived. Hey, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, do you have any idea what the optimal transformation J looks like if your uh, if your potential is not a polynomial and looks like any regular function? If it's not what, sorry? If it's not a polynomial. Because if it's a polynomial, you say that it's a polynomial one degree less. But what happens if it's a fully... Uh, full yes, so... Function? We have an argument in the, in the paper where we essentially uh, show that if you have a sufficiently smooth function which admits... Uh, essentially a Taylor series, you can approximate it by a polynomial, and essentially the quality of our predictions will go, will vanish with the, with the level of approximation that you make in the theory. So essentially you can approximate um, any function by a polynomial, and so the theory should be able to describe what happens. Now, what's the generic form of the preprocessing you would get for this arbitrarily complicated function, we do not know. We have, we have no idea. That's, that's one of the missing thing, is to get the generic recipe to understand how to process the data. It's, uh, the, the problem is that uh, the computations are very technical, so we've been able to carry the, the replica computation for order four and six, and we don't see yet the generic mechanisms. But of course, there's one, there's one. 
And in the limit, the, this kind of replica uh, formulas that we get should depend on infinitely many order parameters, essentially a functional order parameters, and you should get kind of Parisi-like formulas, but this generic structure is still lacking, yeah. But it would be very interesting to understand, I think. Uh, thanks, John, this is uh, super nice work. Thanks. So I guess one, one comment or question I have is, I guess one of the reasons that uh, I ended up analyzing the suboptimal AMP algorithm in that paper was because uh, for any algorithm that's more complicated than this, I couldn't figure out how to get any explicit characterization of the fixed point of the state evolution, right? The state evolution becomes quite complicated as you yes. consider more complex algorithmic procedures. Uh, and I was wondering for your pre-processed AMP algorithm here, whether there's something that simplifies in the structure of the algorithm that lets you characterize what that state evolution fixed point is or to, to gain some more analytical understanding of this? Yes, so we, we thought about that. <laughs> I see Marco doing uh, uh, We thought about that. We tried hard, actually, but uh, we don't have an, an as nice characterization as you have in your paper for, uh, for the fixed points because the, 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 the state evolution that, that we get is, is simply too, too hard. I, we don't see at the moment a simple closed equation for the fixed point like you have, which, which I think is very nice. So we're not able at the moment to, to characterize directly the fixed point. The only results that we get are for the dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Hi, John. Thanks so much for the great talk. Uh, one thing I was wondering about is that in the, like, a closely related model, I guess, in the Gaussian noise setting is this spike covariance model, right? Mm -hmm. like where you could say that yes. every row is independent, but the covariance matrix is low rank plus yes. uh, identity or something. And in the Gaussian noise case, the two models kind of behave roughly the same. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, like, here, do you guys have in mind any analog of the spike covariance things? Because here what happens is that every row in your matrix is still dependent, right? Like if I'm yeah. hoping to come up with a model where every observation is independent, but somehow more um, structured, is there a way to think of that? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, the short answer is, uh, is no. Um, I don't see, uh, I don't see yet a, a natural setting. Let's say a natural extension to the non-symmetric case. No, I, I, if they, I, I guess there should be one, but we didn't investigate too much this this aspect at the moment. Yeah. Uh, are there further questions? Okay, so maybe uh, I can ask a curiosity, Jean, <laughs> uh, because you were mentioning uh, in one of the previous slides that the, the noise is basically, um, um, I mean, in that slide where you have inside and outside the classification and then cats and dog, and then the noise is played by a sort of uh, image in that case. Uh, I was wondering also, attaching to, <laughs> to the previous question, whether you have considered the two, um, I mean, consider noise structured like uh, with a structure similar to the hidden manifold, like in that case. No, no, no. But, but uh, do you think it would be doable, or which would be the limitations? I don't know. I I don't know because really the 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 key the key thing we use in the analysis is this rotational invariance because. Um, if you lose Gaussianity, uh, thanks to a, you can still carry on the computation thanks to a very nice machinery developed by, in particular, Yoshiyuki, uh, that we exploit strongly. Without this, uh, I don't, so, because uh, maybe I didn't emphasize this. Thank you, actually, to give me this opportunity, but let me just emphasize one point. Why is this model, in a sense, uh, not so trivial to, to analyze compared to other type of model. So here is the Bayesian posterior distribution. Let me just compare it to uh, another class of models where rotational invariant matrices have been studied a lot, as we've seen from the previous uh, talk. So which are regression problems. 
the inner regression, you have uh, in, in linear regression, usually, uh, the noise is still considered Gaussian and the structure is inside the design matrix, okay? And if you study this model, you, you see that when you write down the posterior distribution, due to the fact that the noise is Gaussian, the likelihood is still Gaussian, okay? And so you can still carry on the analysis despite the fact that the, this thing is structured. But the fact that you have a Gaussian form here, a quadratic form, allows you to, to, to do computations in, in an easier way. While here, really the main conceptual difference compared to this line of work is really the fact that the structure is in the noise itself, and therefore, when considered in a Bayesian setting, the likelihood is different, and you have the potential appearing here at the level of the likelihood, and this makes your life harder because now you don't have a nice square here and it becomes more painful. So that, that's the main difference. Without the rota But still we can exploit tools developed by Yoshiyuki in, in, in a slightly different ways. Without this, I don't know, but I think it would be very interesting to, to take a look at. Thanks. Okay, so thank you very much. If there are no further questions, uh, I think we can thank Joan. <laughs>